My name is Derek Bros. For the last 10 years, I've worked as an investigative journalist, hosting a radio show, writing books, and producing numerous documentaries about the realities of child trafficking, the dangers of technology, and indigenous struggles. Now, I aim to uncover whether there exists a network of individuals and institutions which ties these issues together. Many researchers posit the existence of an international cartel which covertly manipulates world events for their own benefit. Are these claims simply fantasy and paranoid delusion, or is there truly an agenda to subvert humanity to the demands of the pyramid of power? As we continue the journey to understand the true source of humanity's ills, we have started to identify the first pieces of the pyramid of power. My attempts to confirm or deny the existence of a ruling class led me to investigate the state-run education system, the establishment media, the big tech firms, and the Hollywood propaganda machine. What I have uncovered thus far has been absolutely disturbing. Attempts to manipulate the youth through prison-like education centers, the mainstream media being infiltrated by spies since at least the 1940s, big tech firms manipulating your emotions for profit and control, as well as intelligence connections, and finally, a number of influential and popular Hollywood films collaborating with the CIA in the hopes of rewriting or whitewashing history. It's time to see if I can uncover more connections between government agencies and big corporations. What other pieces of the pyramid of power are waiting to be revealed? Chapter 5, Big Wireless In September 2018, I began investigating the wireless industry after Verizon announced plans to install 5G technology in my hometown of Houston, Texas. My investigation resulted in a documentary called The 5G Trojan Horse. This chapter on Big Wireless is sourced from that documentary. First, let's clarify exactly who or what Big Wireless is. To do that, we need to understand some background information on the wireless industry and wireless technology itself, starting with electromagnetic frequencies, or EMFs. An EMF is a measure of how many times the peak of a wave passes a particular point per second. This range of potential frequencies makes up what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum is divided into separate bands, and the electromagnetic waves within each frequency band are called by different names, including radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma rays at the high-frequency short wavelength end. Devices like cell phones, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth all operate on the microwaves band of the spectrum. When it comes to cell phones, a new generation of cellular standards has appeared approximately every 10 years since 1G systems were first introduced in 1979 and the early to mid-1980s. Each generation features new frequency bands, higher data rates, and non-backwards compatible transmission technology. The second generation, or 2G, featured cell phones with texting and pictures. The third generation came around 2000 with the introduction of phones with some internet, video, and images. The fourth generation came around 2009 with the introduction of smartphones with instant streaming of video as well as the use of apps. In the late teens, early 20s, we began the shift to the fifth generation, or 5G. In addition to being promoted as the solution to 4K movie downloads, the new technology is expected to herald the beginning of smart cities, where driverless cars, traffic lights, pollution sensors, smartphones, and countless other smart devices interact in what is known as the Internet of Things. We will be covering the concerns around smart cities in a future episode. Health Concerns Associated with EMFs As part of my research, I wanted to understand the concerns around EMFs in general. I went through hundreds of studies, including those from official government sources and others funded independently. I found studies like the International and National Expert Group Evaluations, Biological Health Effects of Radio Frequency Fields, which examined six decades worth of research into the effects of in vitro and in vivo exposures of animals and humans and their cells to RF fields. The researchers wrote, quote, data reported in peer reviewed scientific publications were contradictory. Some indicated effects while others did not. Still, in the end, the expert group suggested a, quote, reduction in exposure fields, precautionary approach, and further research. So I continued digging. I found a 2004 study which detected an increased risk of acoustic neuroma tumors associated with mobile phone use of at least 10 years duration. 
I also found studies that were inconclusive, which found, quote, no conclusive evidence of an association between use of mobile and cordless phones and a meningioma brain tumor. The study discovered, quote, an indication of increased risk, but was not, quote, supported by statistically significant increasing risk, ultimately calling for further studies. I came across the name of Dr. Martin Paul, a professor emeritus of biochemistry and basic medical sciences at Washington State University. Paul is a published and widely cited scientist on the biological effects of electromagnetic fields, an expert in how wireless radiation impacts the electrical systems in our bodies. He has published seven studies showing sensitivity to electromagnetic fields exist in what is known as the voltage sensor in each cell of the body. A study by Paul, published in the Journal of Environmental Health, found this sensitivity in human cells in response to Wi-Fi exposure. He calls this effect an important threat to human health. Despite the breadth of his work, Dr. Paul has largely been pushed to the fringes of society. To be fair, his work has been criticized by other scientists who have accused him of bias and cherry-picking studies to support his claims. In 2018, I asked Dr. Martin Paul why his research has been ignored and pushed out of the mainstream conversation. We quit uh, funding the studies of this sort back between 1986 and 1999. We've done almost nothing since then. So, so basically, uh, the U.S. government's been pushing this, these technologies, at the same time doing absolutely nothing, or almost absolutely nothing, to protect us. The debate around the safety of cell phones and other devices that emit EMFs grew even more heated in early November 2018 when the National Toxicology Program released data concluding there is clear evidence radio frequency radiation can cause brain and heart tumors in male lab rats. The $30 million study took more than 10 years to complete as researchers examined the effects of prolonged exposure to high levels of radio frequency radiation, specifically the type of radiation emitted via 2G and 3G cellular networks. The researchers write, quote, There was also some evidence of tumors in the brain and adrenal gland of exposed male rats. For female rats and male and female mice, the evidence was equivocal as to whether cancers observed were associated with exposure to radio frequency radiation. Most damning of all, Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut exposed that the wireless industry and the FCC have failed to do adequate independent studies into the effects of emerging 5G technology. At a Senate Commerce Committee hearing, Blumenthal questioned industry reps about the absence of this research. If you go to the FDA website, pretty unsatisfactory. Uh, there basically uh, is a cursory and superficial citation to existing scientific data saying, quote, the FDA has urged the cell phone industry to take a number of steps, including support additional research on possible biological effects of radio frequency fields for the type of signal emitted by cell phone. Uh, I believe that Americans deserve to know what the health effects are. My question for, for you, particularly Mr. Gillen and Mr. Perry, um, how much money has the industry committed to supporting additional independent research? I stress independent research. Is that independent research ongoing? Has any been completed? Where can consumers look for it? Um, and we're talking about research on the biological effects of this new technology. Thank you, Senator. I, I think, uh, thank you for your focus on the issue. Uh, safety is paramount, and as you alluded to, we rely on the expert agencies, we rely on the findings of the FDA and others as to the requirements to keep all of us safe. Uh, there are no industry back studies to my knowledge right now. Happy to visit with you as to what uh, opportunities you think there needs to be more studies, and we're always for more science. We also rely on what the scientists tell us. At the end of the exchange, Blumenthal concluded, so There really is no research ongoing. We're kind of flying blind here, so far as health and safety is concerned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If you would like to know more about the safety concerns, I recommend watching the 5G Trojan Horse. But what became clear to me is that the so-called health authorities, regulators of the wireless industry, and corporate media have been failing at their jobs. Cover-ups and captured agencies. How could this happen? How can the U.S. government allow potentially hazardous products to be sold and used by millions of people? 
1996, the Telecommunications Act was passed as an effort to update the law around communications technology as the internet was beginning to come into mass public use. The act was also seen as a way to limit the growing AT&T monopoly. Unfortunately, it was the beginning of further consolidation of telecommunications companies and a huge step towards eroding local power. This law is truly revolutionary legislation that will bring the future to our doorstep. The 1996 Act prohibits local jurisdictions from considering perceived health effects when taking action on a proposed facility, such as a tower or a small cell. Instead, cities and towns could only regulate cell sites based on the aesthetics and the location of the devices. The Telecommunications Act of 1996 states, quote, No state or local government or instrumentality thereof may regulate the placement, construction, and modification of personal wireless service facilities on the basis of the environmental effects of radio frequency emissions to the extent that such facilities comply with commissions regulations concerning such emissions. Essentially, as long as the facilities comply with the standards set by the FCC, they cannot be subjected to environmental or health regulations. But what happens if those federal standards set by the FCC in 1996 are not adequate? There are studies which show health effects even at levels allowed by the 1996 Telecommunications Act, not to mention the fact that the standards are over two decades old and based on outdated technology. Not only was the Telecom Act designed to protect the profits of the big wireless companies, but somewhere along the way, the FCC and the telecoms developed an incestuous relationship that has overtaken the voices and the concerns of the people. A 2015 expose published by investigative journalist Norm Ouster shows the financial ties between the U.S. Federal Communications Commission and the telecoms industry and how, as a result, the wireless industry bought unfettered access to and power over a major U.S. regulatory agency. The report, Captured Agency, How the Federal Communications Commission is Dominated by the Industry It Presumably Regulates, details how the FCC, an independent government agency created in 1934 to regulate interstate communications by radio, TV, wire, satellite, and cable, has become a captured agency with big wireless leaders filling the government seats in a revolving door fashion similar to other federal agencies. Regarding the passing of the 1996 Telecom Act, Norm Ouster writes, quote, Late lobbying won the wireless industry enormous concessions from lawmakers, many of them major recipients of industry hard and soft dollar contributions. Congressional staffers who helped lobbyists write the new law did not go unrewarded. 13 of 15 staffers later became lobbyists themselves. Ouster states that the direct lobbying by industry is, quote, just one of many worms in a rotting apple. The report says the FCC is involved in a network of powerful moneyed interests with limitless access and a variety of ways to shape policy. Alster believes the worst part is that the wireless industry has been allowed to grow unchecked and virtually unregulated, with fundamental questions on public health routinely ignored. Unfortunately, the situation goes beyond corrupted government agencies and into defaming those who speak out against potential harms caused by wireless technology. During the 1990s, biochemist Jerry Phillips was hired by cell phone giant Motorola to study the effects of RF radiation emitted by cell phones. Phillips and his colleagues looked at the effects of different RF signals on rats and on cells in a dish. The bottom line really is that, yes, RFR exposure is associated with damage to DNA. Phillips says the relationship between him and his employer was initially cordial but soured once he submitted research data to Motorola which found harmful effects to the DNA structure as a result of exposure to radio frequency radiation. The negative results were not to Motorola's liking and they began putting pressure on him. In another example of industry attempting to influence research, we have Dr. Henry Lai of the University of Washington and fellow researcher Narendra Singh. The researchers were looking at the effects of non-ionizing radiation the same type of radiation emitted by cell phones on the DNA of rats. They used a level of radiation considered safe by FCC standards and found that the DNA in the brain cells of the rats was damaged or broken by exposure to radiation. After publishing his research in 1995, Dr. Lai would later learn of a full-scale effort to discredit the experiments. Lai and Singh caused controversy when they publicly complained about restrictions placed on their research by their funders the Wireless Technology Research Program. In response to this public action, the head of the Wireless Technology Research sent a memo asking then-University President Richard McCormick to fire Lai and Singh. McCormick refused, but the message was clear. 
get rid of anyone who makes our products look bad. In a leaked internal Motorola memo, executives claim to have succeeded in, quote, wargaming the Lysing experiments. This shocked me, the letter trying to discredit me, the war games memo, as a scientist doing research, I was not expecting to be involved in a political situation. It opened my eyes on how games are played in the world of business. You don't bite the hand that feeds you. The pressure is very impressive. Think about that for a moment. An international corporation trying to exert pressure on scientists who draw conclusions that their product is causing harm to human health. Even further, Dr. Lai's experiments show negative health consequences at levels considered safe by the FCC. The captured agency report makes it clear that this type of corruption takes place because of the, quote, free flow of executive leadership between the FCC and industries it presumably oversees. For example, at the time of the report's release, the chairman of the FCC was Tom Wheeler, a man with deep ties to the big wireless industry. In 2013, Wheeler was nominated as FCC chairman by former President Obama after raising more than $700,000 for his presidential campaigns. Wheeler led the two most powerful industry lobbying groups, the National Cable and Telecommunications Association and the Cellular Telecommunications and Internet Association, or the CTIA. The current chairman of the FCC is also another example of a captured agency in action. Ajit Pai, a lawyer and chairman of the FCC under both Obama and Trump, served as an associate general counsel at Verizon Communications between 2001 and 2003, where he handled competition and regulatory matters. Pai was appointed to the FCC by Barack Obama in 2012 and then made FCC chairman by Donald Trump in January 2017. FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr is another example of a government official working closely with industry and maintaining relationships which clearly present conflicts of interest. Carr is credited with accelerating the 5G build-out. Prior to joining the FCC, Carr worked as an attorney at Wiley Ryan where his clients were Verizon, AT&T, CenturyLink, the CTIA, and the USTA, the telecom lobby. The Wiley Ryan Law Firm is a hotbed of activity for former government officials and industry regulars. One of the founders of the law firm is Richard Wiley, himself a former FCC chairman. On September 30, 2019, Commissioner Carr and other officials were in Houston to discuss the future of 5G. I asked Commissioner Carr about the concerns regarding his connections with the wireless industry. I also asked him about the captured agency report released by Harvard School of Ethics. Unfortunately, Mr. Carr had no interest in addressing these questions. We're very excited about the build out of 5G and next gen internet infrastructure. And at the FCC, we've been really building on a lot of the policies that state and local leaders have been putting in place to make sure that every single community can benefit. It's really a great job story. It's a great story for economic growth. So we're really happy with the progress that we're seeing in building out 5G, both here in Houston and a lot of other communities around the country. What about those who have concerns, uh, say for example, Harvard that put out the study about captured agency that folks like yourself who've been lawyers and worked in the industry are essentially captured the, the regulators, you know, this idea that the FCC can't be trusted to regulate 5G and cell phones and things of that sort because of not only yours but Ajit Pai and others' uh, industry connections. Yeah, we're really glad to see the growth in 5G. And one of the things that we've done at the FCC is build on the policies put in place in by local elected leaders, elected leaders here in Houston, Texas, the state legislator put policies in place that help guide the way for 5G builds. So we're really excited with the progress that we're seeing by really taking the lead of so many of these local elected officials. No comment on the conflict of interest concerns? Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Good to talk to you. The following day, I was able to question Commissioner Carr for a second time, and once again, he avoided my questions. Mr. Carr, can I follow up with you on yesterday? Oh, I'm good, man. Thank you. All right. Well, then we'll just do it this way. All right. So, look, you have ties to the industry. We'll just be more blunt this time since trying nice doesn't seem to work with you guys. So, you have ties to the industry. Thanks, man. We're not you omitted right those facts. This is not press. You're a public per servant. You're walking the streets. Um, so, you've been with the FCC. You've worked with a law, with a, a law firm that defended the CTI, the people who organized this whole thing. The CTI gave the mayor the 5G wireless champion award. I mean, essentially, this whole thing was just a big industry. There's not a single mention of lawsuits on the state level, on the federal level. I'm sure you're aware that there are cities in Texas that are suing right now because those are the stakeholders that are being ignored. They're not, you know, the surveillance concerns are being ignored. You guys talk about all these sensors, all these great things, but not a single person mentioned that there are privacy concerns, there are health concerns that I know you're aware. The FCC recently announced that they're even going to 
reevaluate cell phones because the Chicago Tribune study showed that iPhones are putting off 200 times the radiation that you guys allow and say is safe. I mean, realistically, you can't even comment on that. Thanks, man. It's really good to see you again. Thanks for showing off the event. Appreciate it. Of course I'm here. But, I mean, I'm just saying people see you respond like this, and it doesn't even seem like human. It just You can't even, like, acknowledge or say a simple statement. But I guess that's what we should expect from the federal government. Much of this revolving door relationship between industry and government can be traced to the CTIA, the Cellular Telecommunications and Internet Association. Established in 1984, the CTIA claims to represent the U.S. wireless communications industry from carriers and equipment manufacturers. The CTIA is active on a wide range of issues, including spectrum policy, wireless infrastructure, and the Internet of Things. They also host events on topics ranging from cybersecurity to 5G. The CTIA's board of directors includes the presidents, CEOs, and other senior officials of Verizon, T-Mobile, Nokia, Ericsson, Intel, General Motors, TrackPhone, and Easy Texting. Brad Gillen, the current executive vice president of the CTIA, was formerly a legal advisor to a former FCC commissioner and served in other senior policy roles at the FCC and DISH Network. Mr. Gillen was also a partner at Wilkinson, Barker, and Nauer, a law firm stacked with former employees of the FCC, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, the FTC, and other state government positions. The CTIA's current president and CEO is Meredith Atwell Baker. Baker has spent the last two decades bouncing between lobbying for big wireless and working for the government. From 1998 to 2000, Baker worked as director of the congressional affairs at the CTIA. Afterwards, she worked for the U.S. government as an FCC commissioner between July 2009 to June 2011. She then went back to the CTIA, where she is now president and CEO in charge of promoting the so-called Race to 5G. The Race to 5G could be described as a clever marketing campaign designed to sell consumers an upgrade they did not know they wanted or needed. Not to mention an upgrade that has sparked lawsuits and has many health and privacy concerns. As part of the ongoing race to 5G, telecom companies are promoting 5G as a solution for faster downloads and high-definition movie streaming. Although it's not clear if the public is demanding faster downloads, the telecoms, global governments, and the tech industry are pushing the shift towards 5G. While it is true that 5G has the potential to spur on innovation in the fields of medicine, manufacturing, entertainment, and other industries, there has not been a truly organic call for this emerging technology. Much of the hype around 5G is coming from the CTIA itself. It appears that the CTIA, the organization created to lobby explicitly for the wireless industry, along with their partners in government agencies, law firms, and international health authorities, are, in fact, big wireless. 5G is a race, and we must win. These institutions work together to stifle research, which shows the harmful effects of their products while placing loyal agents in government and regulatory fields. But what about the media? Why has the mainstream media failed to report on these concerns? As more health professionals, politicians, and scientists speak out against the dangers of EMFs, the cellular industry and some in the mainstream media have begun pushing back. In March 2019, William Broad of the New York Times wrote a piece promoting the idea that those who are concerned about the health effects of 5G are simply falling prey to Russian propaganda designed to make America lose the race to 5G. His article, Your 5G Phone Won't Hurt You, But Russia Wants You to Think Otherwise, sought to place the blame for concern around 5G on the shoulders of America's favorite boogeyman, the Russians. Interestingly, he failed to mention that in April 2019, the Times announced a partnership with Verizon to showcase a 5G journalism lab. This seems to be a new trend for corporate media, as the Washington Post also announced a similar deal with AT&T in November 2019. Questions regarding potential conflicts of interest have not been answered. Dr. Dever Davis, PhD, president of the Environmental Health Trust, responded to the New York Times claims by noting that, quote, by relegating concerns about 5G to a Russian ploy, he misses altogether the fact that the purportedly independent international authorities on which he relies that declare 5G to be safe are an exclusive club of industry loyal scientists. China, Russia, Poland, Italy, and several other European countries allow up to hundreds of times less wireless radiation into the environment from microwave antennas than does the US. 
Davis went even further, comparing the treatment of those who raise awareness about the public impact of radio frequency radiation to that of the scientists in the 1950s and 60s who attempted to ring alarm bells about the dangers of tobacco. Quote, scientists who showed the harmful impacts of tobacco find themselves struggling for serious attention and financial support. For health impacts from wireless radiation, a similar pattern is emerging. Each time a U.S. government agency produced positive findings, research on health impacts was defunded. The Office of Naval Research, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, and the Environmental Protection Agency all once had vibrant research programs documenting dangers of wireless radiation. All found their programs scrapped, reflecting pressure from those who sought to suppress this work. So this brings us to a new understanding. The wireless industry, the media, and government agencies created to regulate the wireless industry have been conspiring for more than two decades to cover up their corruption and endanger public health. We should also remember that this is not only a problem in the United States. There are agencies and institutions acting in the same manner all around the world. So what can we do about it? Solutions. When it comes to fighting against the corruption within government agencies, step one is to expose it. We need mass movements aimed at exposing all of the elements of the pyramid, including big wireless. For those who believe in voting and fighting in the political arena, make efforts to get rid of these corrupt politicians in the captured agencies. And while it is true that the corporate media has attempted to paint anyone who has concerns around wireless technology as conspiracy theorists, the numbers are growing. If we continue to expose this information, we can build a movement that will support bringing the truth to light. At the same time, we can also try to limit our exposure and use of wireless devices. And this might sound crazy in a world as interconnected as ours, but if we do take some individual responsibility, then ultimately, we are to blame for invasions of our privacy, potentially harmful effects, and for supporting a corrupt industry. It's up to you to decide what this looks like. Additionally, there are companies which sell protective gear, clothing, and devices to protect you from EMF exposure. There is also the possibility of rewiring your house by choosing to plug into your modem rather than use Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. You can buy wired keyboards and mice as well. This will require lifestyle changes, but it can be done. As with all of the solutions presented within this series, creating change for the better will require individual responsibility and action, while also building movements for collective liberation. Together, we can finally break free from the grip of Big Wireless. For more information on this topic, we recommend watching the 5G Trojan Horse documentary and reading the Captured Agency Report by the Harvard School of Ethics.